No, oh, that's really interesting. Okay. Today, we're very pleased to have um, Dr. Paul Woods, who uh, serves on faculty here at OCMS. And it was really Paul's idea uh, to put together this whole uh, um, series on Central Asia. And I've been very uh, uh, pleased with the kind of response we've had, the kind of interest that's been shown. And it's just been an excellent series. And, and, and Paul has a presentation that will uh, is kind of the capstone to bring this all together. So, and and so with that, I will turn it over to Paul and let you go ahead. Thank you, Tom. Let me apologize in advance. My uh, headphone uh, broke two days ago, so 
I have to hold it to the side of my head as if I'm really important, which, which I'm not. But anyway, thanks for the introduction, Tom. And um, yeah, this is my first sort of um, attempt at some research focused on Central Asia and using some new uh, methods, at least for me. So it's kind of experimental. And what I've tried to do, let me just get to my second slide. What I've tried to do is the first few, uh, first three lectures we had were basically um, information and bringing people up to speed on the region. And I thought I would try to present what I call a research lecture in the sense that I'm not just gathering stuff from here and there, but I'm actually trying to, I'm actually trying to do something new myself. Um, so in that sense, it's a lecture based out of a research paper I'm writing and it shows some experimental concepts and methods. Um, so that's the sort of disclaimer if you don't like it um, as it goes forward. Uh, so there's a map of uh, Kyrgyzstan in the top corner and that's based on the national flag. And a couple of points of orientation as we begin. So Kyrgyzstan was part of the Russian Empire, beginning from the late 19th century, became a Soviet Republic, or became a Soviet territory, eventually was formed as a Kyrgyz Republic later on, and of course achieved independence in August 1991. So at the moment, we might say some of the three big motifs in, in Kyrgyzstan is this post-Soviet status, which is almost like a kind of post-colonial status, if you want, the whole issue of nation building and even the reinvention of tradition, and how um, things are being kind of formed from nowhere to say there always was a Kyrgyz nation, very kind of controversial stuff. And of course, the um, Islamic heritage, just over 80% of people in Kyrgyzstan are claimed to be Muslims of one kind or another. And then this curious woman, Zere Asilbek, who uh, made the song, and in a sense, the song is not all about her, but it's focused through her. She is a young woman, early 20s, feminist activist and campaigner for a women's rights and general sort of left wing, you know, fairness, inclusive kind of person. And she wrote this song as the beginning of a song kind of writing career, but also as a piece of activism. And that comes obviously through through the talk. A bit of background about her, as I said, she's quite young. She speaks Kyrgyz, Russian, English very well. Uh, she's an urban Kyrgyz from actually her family is from different parts of the country but she's basically grown up in Bishkek and she's one of the urban Russian speaking Kyrgyz so she made the song using Kyrgyz language uh, for reasons that will emerge but actually she her first language is, is Russian so there's a whole kind of dynamic around that as well and at the bottom you can just see the whole nature of of the contestation of Kyrgyzstan um I've tried to summarize some of it here. I mean, on the left, you've got this woman who is uh, a woman who occupies a role in a formal international setting. So there she is at some international conference. And then you've got the traditional sort of Kyrgyz man with the, with the hat, which shows, tends to be used these days for a sign of conservatism, not always, but often comes across that way. It's a bit like the flag of St. George in the UK. It should be neutral, but it has certain uh, associations with it, perhaps for some people. And then you've got these two girls, you know, with a more kind of Islamic look to them. And then finally, you've got, this is a recent picture, you can tell by the masks after the recent election, just showing the sort of the power of, of crowds. And when I first met Kanat, who's our, one of our students, I asked him about democracy in Kyrgyzstan. He said, yeah, it's very democratic. Whenever we don't like them, we all pour onto the street and take the place to pieces. So this is kind of one of their um, forms of democracy, which we'll probably see tomorrow in various parts of, of the United States as well. So I'm going to play you a video, um, which is on the, I suppose, kind of on the edge of NSFW, but I think you'll be all right with it. And it's part of the research. Let me just take this back and then I can get it going. Okay, Tom, let me know if you can see the video. Okay, not yet. Not yet. How's that? That's it. You got it. Look at the subtitles because the the lyrics are in Kyrgyz anyway.
Okay, let me go back to my presentation. Okay, are we back? Yeah, we're back. So you might wonder, not a particularly astonishing song, and not a particularly brilliant video. But this song was released in uh, September 2018, and the song was initially quite well received. And then she decided, Zere decided to make a video. And the video, which you've just seen, caused an absolute storm in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I guess looking at it from a, a Western point of view, you may wonder what all the fuss is about, but some of the motifs will come out later on. We think you have a girl wearing a hijab. You have another girl with blue hair and an ear piercing, uh, which is just dynamite in that for some people in that part of the world. And you have all these women running together in different kinds of clothing and, and different amounts of clothing, which is all designed to provoke, which it certainly did. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of what she's trying to do, she's trying to promote diversity. She's trying to promote acceptance that you can just be who you are. Don't tell me what to do. And you see that in some of the lyrics I've given an extract of here and the whole idea of empowerment. Um, so she doesn't want people to say, do this and don't do that. You know, why should I be what you want? And, and where's your respect for me? And at the beginning, she says, I wish the time would come and people don't tell us how to live. And later on, she says, the time will come the era will pass. So it's a kind of a cry for uh, freedom and recognition. So why did she do this? Well, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, we can look at the some of the issues of women for women face in Kyrgyzstan. Now, according to the law, they have equal status. And there are female politicians, one female, fem a previous president of Kyrgyzstan was a woman. There are a lot of uh, feminine, female officials. There's a lot of feminine presence in the business world. And quite a large number of national and local NGOs advocate for women. And you can see um, on the right-hand side of this slide, there's actually this forum of women's NGOs of Kyrgyzstan. There's a whole grouping of NGOs that ad advocating for women. So you would have thought that there is a kind of a good um, status for women, uh, especially as it's coming out of the a Soviet period, which very much tried to emphasize equality. Now, the reality is, although there are many positive things for women in Kyrgyzstan, there is something of a disconnect between the law and real life, because the reality in the second half of the slide um, is it is a traditional patriarchal society, especially in the countryside. Um, and following the collapse of the Soviet Union and a more kind of globalized presence for Islam, there is a sort of post-Soviet resurgence of Islam. Now, again, scholars disagree perhaps about how much this is, but probably it's not ex an excessive or kind of a dangerous resurgence of Islam, but there are certainly degrees of conservatism. One of the three things that women face, and I used to have a, a good friend who was, um, in fact, I've lost touch with her, but she is actually a professor of women's issues in Kyrgyzstan, and she, she was giving a presentation in Oxford years ago, and she was talking about the problem of domestic violence. It's a very serious issue in, in Kyrgyzstan. And the fact that women's roles are limited, in some cases by law, there are certain jobs that women are not allowed to take. Um, and there is this famous um, tradition in Kyrgyzstan called bride kidnapping, where a woman can be just be, be kidnapped by the friends or relatives of a man and forced to marry um, this man against her will, sometimes involving rape as well. And the bottom picture on the screen is of a woman called Budalai, who was a potential, or hoped to be a medical student, she was kidnapped from her home um, not long before this video was made. The song was made in 2018. And she was taken to a man's house to be forced to be married to him. When she refused that, she managed to escape. And then she was put into, a, into the police station. And this guy appeared and eventually murdered her. So the issue of bride kidnapping is a very, very serious issue in Kyrgyzstan. And when this um, whole story broke, uh, Zere decided that she would make a song partly as a response to the issue of bride kidnapping and the overall sense of women lacking rights in Kyrgyzstan. So that's the sort of background. And I have a video which shows Zere walking on the street in Bishkek. And this picture of Budalai is actually on the side of a huge building. It's a mural about 15 meters high or so. So that's the background. 
Another part of the background is about the public sphere in Kyrgyzstan um, as part of the civil society. And if you look at the five stands that emerged from the Soviet Union, the, the, the public sphere in Kyrgyzstan is the most vibrant. Um, still, although there's been a slight reduction in uh, space, but still the most vibrant, still the most open and contentious public sphere in that whole region. And so there's a whole range of voices and influences and factors that are going on in here. It's a very contested space. So there is an urban rural divide. The uh, urban people tend to be more open minded, more cosmopolitan than the people in the countryside. There's this whole issue also of how decisions are made between the individual and the consensus, which feeds into notions of kind of honor, shame cultures and um, the clan coming around and making decisions and all those kind of related anthropological issues. Another tension is between the Islamists, or let's not say Islamists, between followers of Islam and secularists, and some of the followers of Islam are Islamists. So there's a whole range of opinion there. And social media and digital platforms, they reckon that probably internet penetration use is probably about half of the population of, of Kyrgyzstan now. Um, extremely important actually in Kyrgyzstan and the whole region, the social media, Facebook, VK, Instagram, Twitter, very, very strong in um, that part of the world. And you often have cross national postings and movements because people are posting in Russian or English uh, rather than local languages. And um, TV, there are many uh, free, several TV stations in Kyrgyzstan, they're free, they're um, of course, there's always a dance with the government, but there's an astonishing amount of freedom to publish and, and print and, and go on television. Likewise, radio stations and news websites. Um, but at the same time, or maybe because of that, just as perhaps in the West, you know, in Western Europe and North America, there is this issue of polarization. So there is now a kind of a backlash as the feminists try to push for their space. The nationalists and the right wing tend to push back. And so there is this group of people called um, Kirk Chodo, the 40 Knights, who are a kind of rather unpleasant right wing group who um, push back at feminist demonstrations, push back at women's idea of women's being, women being more liberated, a very strong anti-Chinese movement. Um, they go to nightclubs and if Kyrgyz women are dancing with Chinese men, they'll come and give them a talking to or cut their hair and so on. So there is this sort of nationalist backlash from the Kirk Chodo. Um, and I guess part of this whole issue in the public sphere that I've been looking at is, is how, how it's a transnational movement. Um, so, so how contextualized uh, is the transnational movement? How contextualized is the, what people like Zeli are trying to do into the Kyrgyz context? And the video is, is an example. You know, how, how contextual is that video? How suitable is that video for a rather more traditional people coming out of Soviet heritage and 80% of them are, are, are Muslim? Um, whereas probably wouldn't bat an eye at that kind of video in, in the UK and other Western countries. So the whole issue of how contextualized that is, is very uh, uppermost in, in my mind. But a recent article I read by an American commentator said, well, actually the, the chaos in Kyrgyzstan is evidence that democracy is functioning. The fact that you can get out and have arguments and you can make these videos and you can have people arguing either in the street or on the internet is actually evidence of democratic openness which of course is, is true. So what did I do? Um, I tried to use a variety of methods, um, partly because I, I came across this song and I was already familiar with feminist um, movements in Kyrgyzstan. So I thought, how do I make sense of this song? How do I get to grips with this? Um, so somehow from somewhere, I've actually forgotten, I got hold of the video, fortunately with the subtitles on. And then I began to poke around and there's a number of um, sources and I put them into or methods. I use three sort of textual approaches if you want and one visual. Um, so I looked at lots of interviews with Zeri and they were either um, in video form or they were in magazines or they're on blogs. And from those videos, I was able to cull various details about why she made the video, what she intended to do with the video and even how the video was put together and then, of course, some of the responses to the video. And then I use the same kind of approach to deal with what people had written or said about the song and the reaction to it. So again, there are videos about why she made the song, how people responded, what people thought about the song, 
two very good broadcasts on the radio, one on BBC, one on PRI, where they actually went to Kyrgyzstan or dealt with um, Kyrgyz journalists and asked them, what do you think about this? And then I actually looked at the words of the song. So um, I got hold of different translations. Um, I worked mainly with the English one. I referred to the Russian lyrics and I had my good friend Kanat check the Kyrgyz lyrics because they were the original ones to see if they actually re reflected well what the Russian and the English were, were saying. So it was very important to go back and check the, the Kyrgyz lyrics. And then finally, and this is the bit that I have to, it's a bit of a shame I don't have lots of clips of this, it's just a bit of visual anthropology. And I got some hints on this years ago from David Zeitlin. I went to have a chat with him in Oxford. Um, and this interfaces with some of the uh, comments that she made about how she made the video. So here I've got a couple of screen grabs and you can see um, there's a picture of a girl wearing black and, and the same girl wearing white. Um, and these were shot in juxtaposition very quickly in the video. If you, you probably don't remember from what you've just seen, but it's there in the video. And the idea that Zeta is trying to give us here is that you can't judge a person by their appearance. And so what may be black is actually white, what may be white is actually black, depending on whether you know that person or not. So, so what she's saying is don't judge a book by its cover. That's the kind of approach she's trying to bring. And then the next couple of pictures right in the bottom corner, you see uh, in my paper, I call a hijab girl and, and blue hair girl. And this is a screen grab or two screen grabs from when the camera is moving round in a circle. It actually does that twice, once at the beginning and once at the end of the video. And the idea is to show Zeri at the center of this kind of diversity. So you have a girl wearing a sort of Western kind of evening dress, holding her phone, taking a selfie. You have the blue hair girl who has a industrial ear piercing. You have the hijab girl representing the Islamic side. And you have another girl with a just a kind of a, a covering on her head, which is a sort of more traditional sign of a conservative woman, if you like. Uh, so you have all this idea of, of diversity and, and everyone is equal and everyone's brought together. And then this picture on the left is again showing the diversity, but also the point about the lake is that this is the biggest lake in Kyrgyzstan called Isakul. And the video was made there because it's so cool as a lake represents, in a sense, the heart of the Kyrgyz people, but also the modern public sphere, the modern debate. So Zeri says the idea we all jump into this water is we're all jumping into this kind of fermenting public opinion. That's what she was trying to, to bring about there. So there's a lot more to the video, perhaps, than appears at first blush. So I put some of my sources here just to... I made this slide messy on purpose because the whole process is messy. But I wanted to show you, just kind of bring to your attention a couple of points. So uh, the top left, you see a woman interviewing Zere in a Russian language program on a channel called Azatuk uh, Unalgasi. And this, is a, this was a Russian language interview where she was asked all about the video and so on and so forth. And she, she, she described some of this um, visual anthropological uh, motifs that she used. And that's about a half an hour video in Russian. And in the middle, there's a grab from a, her phone. And this is one of the postings that came as a reaction to the video. This is in Kyrgyz. And it says basically, if you don't remove your video and ask the Kyrgyz people for forgiveness, I will chop your head off. Okay. Um, and on the right, there's another screen from another interview where she just talks about the uh, bride kidnapping. Now, the central picture there of her with her phone you can see on the left and the right, there's a kind of a summary of English translations of some of the reaction that the video caused. So the left-hand side, very brave, great performance. Those are all obviously positive comments. And then on the right-hand side, you have, you know, hijab and naked women, disgusting, go naked, but don't spoil it for others. You know, our youth are gonna become dogs, you brought shame. So there's this real polarization in reaction. And these are some of the more polite comments that are translated into English and put into a video that I got. Um, next to that, you see Zere looking down, and this is a screen wrap from a, a, a documentary about her, and it's called God Zere, which means the year of Zere, made by a foundation in Central Asia. Again, interviewing her, why did you make this video? What did you try to achieve? What was the reaction? Um, and then at the bottom, you have this picture from She is Nomad, and it says, this is the girl who's the girl who sings songs, the girl who sings Zere Asselbeck. So this is a focus from a, 
a Russian language blog which focuses on women, women activists, and so it writes about about Zede. So I looked at all these kind of sources to try and build up a picture of what was going on. Um, and as I say, an experimental um, action for me coming from my, my background, but, but good fun. So what did I find? Um, the top few lines are really what Zede was trying to do. So she, she was looking for self-determination for women. And yet actually in the song, there's no reference to women. And one of her interviews, she makes the point that if you come from outside Kyrgyzstan, you have no idea what this is about. She said, if you live in Kyrgyzstan, you know instantly this is a song about women's rights. Of course, the fact that there are no men in the video is kind of something of a giveaway. But nonetheless, she says it was there under the surface, but it really was for local people to pick up on. Um, and as I mentioned before, in the whole the video, there's a whole thing about you know diversity, tolerance. Why can't we be recognized? Doesn't matter what you look like or, or, or what you do. It's about the value of people inside and the whole question of first impressions. And then she has this issue of the struggle for women now. They do struggle, but change will come. And in the video, you may remember, in the middle, there's a section where she's sitting on a swing. And she's kind of at peace, just on the swing, relaxing as the struggle is, is, is over, so to speak. Now, what really came out of this song and the uh, videos and the, the research that I did is that she was quite struck herself by the reaction because the song initially was very popular and a few weeks later the video appeared and caused a storm as i've said and basically the whole response of the more conservative people was defined by one thing which was zeri's appearance basically people were mortified that she wore um a purple bra with a blazer over the top and that was the only thing which seemed to annoy people not even the other women running around it was just that she was the main singer and she actually she took a bra which was white and dyed it with purple dye and then put it on and put this blazer over the top and that just put people off for those people who were wanted to be put off so people no longer listened to the words no longer looked at the question of diversity it was all governed by this woman with a blazer and a bra and so you have this massive polarization um for and against and I guess like many other things in our world today, it's as much a symptom of an existing polarization as the result of, of what she did herself. But the result of it was she actually received death threats. You'll come and chop off your head. You better be careful where you go at night. Don't go out on your own. And she's accused of bringing shame to, especially in the more nationalist groups of, of people. So when she received the death threats and she had them on her phone and they're all in the, in the, in the media, she went to the police and she said, look, people are threatening my life. Um, I want to make a complaint. So the police, this, the, the video was released in September, late September, 2018. She went to the police a few days after all this broke out. And then on the 10th of October, they said, we looked into the case, there's nothing to report. There's no danger to you. So the whole investigation took about, you know, 12 days to prove that there was no case to answer and all these people um, were not really causing any problems. Now, some of the research I've done, some of the reading I've done suggests that, I mean, there's an interview with a police chief or a senior police official in Bishkek at, at the time, who said that the nationalist group Kirk Choro actually was receiving funding from the police department in Bishkek. So there are some strange connections under the surface here between the right wing and, and, and the police. So, Talking about this with 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 Kanat, who's my um, my go-to guy for Kyrgyz issues, he's an open-minded young fellow, and he said, "Yeah, I think the, the the lyrics were fine. It was good that she sang in Kyrgyz." But his point was, "Why on earth make this ridiculous video? Because if you're singing in Kyrgyz as a Russian speaker, if you sang in Kyrgyz to reach local people in the countryside, you know, did it never cross her mind that those same people would be put off by the video?" So, so there's a sense um, from him and also his wife that she shot herself in the foot by making a video of this particular form. She was kind of ahead of, ahead of the game in a sense and pushed too far when she could have actually moderated it and made a much more inclusive uh, product to bring people on side. Um, but that certainly did lead into more radical promotion of women's rights and issues and we can touch on that um, briefly. So the girl in the public sphere, um, 
I've put a piece of uh, two, some bits of string tied together at the top right because um, I have this sense of of reading about her and looking at the various sources that she represents a sort of a nexus of very complicated factors, and she's kind of stuck there in the middle. She's you know like a in a spider's web. So so the public sphere is is an incredibly contested uh, place. Um, and she's right at the center of all, of all this stuff. And I suppose that there are three things that, that, that come to mind, um, which her video represents to me and, and what happened as a result is that, first of all, she, in her mind, at least in the minds of people who like her, there's a perceived need for this kind of song and this kind of video. And maybe the video is not the best video, but there was a perceived need for some kind of commentary. Um, because the existing work of the NGOs and the legal provisions and so on and so forth, for her were not effective enough. So this stuff was at the higher level and it was not distilling down into the lives of ordinary Kirkus women. So in her mind, there's a perceived need that this video had to be made. And she was, of yes, she was being provocative um, because of what she'd seen in her life as, um, a feminist activist. But the video also represents um, the way the video functioned in the society, the way that it appeared on social media, the way it evoked this kind of comment on people's phones and so on and so forth, suggests again, you have this very strong contestation between conservatives and more open people, younger people and older people, uh, secularists and, and Muslim people. Um, so she she kind of exemplifies this ongoing tension in, in the society and i suppose the third issue about the contestation is the sort of medium to longer term developments which resulted from this song and the video because not long after this she gave a concert in kazakhstan a few weeks uh, last year in april she was in uh, tbilisi in georgia at a feminist convention where she was interviewed about her activism and so on and so forth. So there's been a kind of a um, ongoing consequences of this, that the, the contestation has evoked responses in in Central Asia, in, in the Caucasus, in Eastern Europe and other places. So there are kind of different levels of how the contestation has been playing out. Um, in a sense, what she has done represents a microcosm of a broader tension between the urban and rural areas in various aspects of, of Kyrgyz society. And again, there's nothing, it's not unique to Kyrgyzstan by any means, but there is this sense of the sort of uh, uh, the yokel person, the person from the back of beyond the hick who comes from the countryside to the city. And in a sense, some of what she's doing is um, is representing that. So the people in the countryside who live in the yurta, who are who are herding, you know, and they're young women who are herding sheep and goats, are a thousand miles away from Zede, who sits in a fancy coffee shop in Bishkek, drinking coffee imported from Seattle or whatever, you know. So there's this whole divide there which she represents. Another issue of the contestation about the public public sphere is um, just how important the family and the clan still are in many young people's um, decision-making processes, what to study, whom to marry, whether to marry. Um, so in many senses, the video speaks of, of individualism or individual rights. Okay, there's a group of women together, but in many ways, um, it speaks of women kind of fighting for individual rights, which would, for some people would be seen as being at odds with with a more traditional kind of a family clan orientation. And in many cases, you have these, um, the gray beards, the Aksakal people, the older men who represent sort of village elders who sit around and make decisions and give advice. You know, and they have said any, any public event that should be a gray beard. And these gray beards tend to be not particularly open to women's rights. So it's another example of the contestation of the maybe more individual semi-westernized or maybe slightly Russified view compared to more traditional Kyrgyz view. Um, and then you have this whole question of just the traditional mindset. I saw a video with two very nice old men interviewed on the street, one in uh, Kyrgyz, one in Russian, and they both say, you know, we don't need this here. Take it to America, take it to France, but don't, don't do it here. 
and, and also two young girls just saying the same thing, you know, this is not what we want. And so there's a kind of criticism that Zeri, as part of the public sphere, you know, she represents part of this Bishkek elite. It's okay for you with your coffee and your Russian, you know, and your short skirt, but actually, how representative are you of, of, of the nation? Um, and then kind of bringing, pulling the camera out, if you'd like, just this whole question of, of the authorities, to what extent are the authorities sort of giving tacit agreement, or some of the authorities, maybe to be more fair, giving tacit agreement to the more conservative forces, the more right-wing forces, you know, to what extent are the authorities turning a blind eye to the activities of Kirk Choro and, and other people? Um, about a year after this, there was a big celebration of women's issues in Bishkek, and there was a exhibition of women's rights in a big conference center, which was extremely controversial, even had a naked woman walking around. And these people turned up outside and they basically said the exhibition has to end. The woman in charge of the museum lost her job. There was a big inquiry and the authorities were seen as being somewhat related to this process. So this is part of the authorities, you know, reaching into the public sphere in a more authoritarian kind of sense. And in today's world, as part of this issue of the public sphere, the internet is actually a massive um, factor these days. So you've got followers, fans, and trolls, you know, and the, the level of dialogue uh, in the public sphere in a place like Kyrgyzstan over these issues is actually massive. Um, so, you know, don't think for, for one moment that people in Central Asia are not, you know, going at it hammer and tongs across the internet because they actually are, and it's a very, very vibrant sphere. Um, so did the girl really make any difference? Well, part of the contestation comes out in this uh, picture at the bottom of the screen. Vashi Tradizia, Nasha Kurov, your traditions, our blood. And so this is again, part of this polarization. You, know, you want your traditions to stay in the Kyrgyzstan in whatever century you think we're in, but that's actually our blood that's being spilt. Of course, this is being written by, by women. So, so given that it's, given an impetus to the public debate, given that it's it's forced more debate about feminism and it's empowered feminists, um, you can say it has made a difference. Given that it's caused polarization and some degree of violence and some degree of pushback, you may say, well, the difference has not been completely positive. Um, I, th I think I have a slide of, of the lyrics, but we can save that to later, just in case you want to look at the whole song. It's there, but only I'll put that on if, if you want to discuss any of the lyrics, but they're not particularly creative. So that's kind of basically what I had in mind to, to share with you um, today. Slightly faster than I thought it would be, but uh, yeah. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, let's go ahead and um, may I invite people to uh, raise their hands and... and um, ask Paul or make a comment uh, uh, on, on his uh, presentation. Uh, Paul, let me start off um, by asking, you know, it's really interesting in that she's Russian. Well, she's Kyrgyz, but Russian speaking. Yeah, she's Russian speaking, but yeah. she, she appears to be more part of that urban class, that yeah. post-Soviet class. And one of the things about, you know, the Soviet system, although it was uh, imperfect, it tended to emphasize the equality of the sexes. I mean, part Absolutely. of the whole um, ideology of the Soviet Union was to change and transform ancient feudal society into this yeah. modern society. Yeah. And it was just interesting in terms of your talk, in terms of, it seems that her stuff was actually directed to more traditional modes of understanding communal identity. So, mm -hmm. so the idea of shame, mm -hmm. national shame would be almost a, um, like a, a, an ethnic communal identity versus that, that sense of this modernism and this modernity. Was any of that playing out in this in terms of, because I don't know too much about independence, but is that has strong ethnic tribal understanding of the self um, in terms of the modern Kyrgyz state? It's actually very complicated because um, if you go back uh, to the 50s, I think it was, that was when the, um, the Soviets set up these various Soviet republics in Central Asia. 
and they actually carved out republics based on what they thought were kind of aggregations of people of different races. So the Kyrgyz people, Kazakh people, um, Turkmen people. But actually, those people are very much spread out around the region. So you have a lot of Uzbeks in the Fergana Valley, mm. which caused conflict in the southern part of Kyrgyzstan. So there wasn't a sense of national identity, perhaps, that, that we might think there was in the uh, middle kind of Soviet period. Now, as you come towards independence, Kyrgyzstan actually did not really want to be independent or leave the Soviet Union in the first place mm. as, as a nation. Um, now, since independence, and that's why I mentioned nation building in the first slide, you have the um, Kyrgyz epic, the Manas, which is a sort of a, you know romantic kind of Robin Hood kind of, you know, people knights on armor running around kind of epic, has been co-opted now and there's even a Manas museum. So you have kind of Hobsbawm and the reinvention of tradition. So you have people sort of creating a uh, heritage. It was there, but you have it being co-opted for certain purposes. Yeah. And I think some of that stuff is kind of reacting uh, with this idea of the rights of women. Um, at the same time, what some people have said is it's kind of striking at how quickly the Soviet ideas of, of equality have been sort of ditched by traditional mindset people in Kyrgyzstan. So some people say the sort of Sovietization was only was only skin deep. Mm. Then again, I mean the Russians themselves got rid of communism in about two days when, you know, after after they got rid of it. So, you know, so when, after their collapse. So so there is a question maybe there was just a veneer of, of the Soviet culture, which was actually removed quite click quite quickly. Although those intellectuals and academics and well read people in the city would obviously be retaining more of that. So that's a very difficult um, point to kind of get your head around in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, David, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for this very, very interesting lecture. Uh, I'm just wondering if you're aware uh, of the difference between northern Kyrgyzstan and southern Kyr Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and I'm just wondering if uh, Kyrgyz women in the north of the country are relatively freer uh, than women in the south, because I suppose uh, the north is relatively less Islam Islamized uh, and more into what's called pre-Islamic Tangrism. Um, yeah. I know, I know Tabliki Jamaat is playing its part uh, as it is in other, uh, many other countries around the world in reviving Islam in, in Kyrgyzstan, but it's probably not being done in a in a way that is uniform. Yes. Uh, and then there is also this parallel revival of ethnicity, uh, both in the north and, and, and south of Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering how that is creating more space for women to express themselves. OK, thank you, David. Yeah, I am aware of the difference between the north and the south. Um, mm. I, Generally speaking, the south is seen as more conservative. Of course, you're right. Um, I don't know, in terms of a, a response to feminist issues, how strong the influence of Tengrism is. I would probably think not particularly strong. Uh -huh. um, and generally speaking, although we, uh, you're absolutely right, there's a difference between even in Islam in its degree of conservatism, north and south. Um, but it's only a small minority of of people who've, uh, in terms of this video, who've objected to it on the basis of being a conservative Muslim. Mm -hmm. There are more people who say, you know, we don't need this here because we're not that kind of people. You know, we're, we're traditional people. You know, and if you showed this kind of video in some other countries that we would consider not so Islamic, they they may still say, well, we think this is not really appropriate. Yeah. So so the the actual um, strongly Islamic based objection to this. Uh, I think is relatively small, but there is a difference between North and South. And again, the other issue is um, Bishkek is not very far from the Kazakh border. Yeah. And Almaty is not very far from the, from the uh, Kyrgyz border and Tashkent is not that far. So you have a kind of a, you have several fairly big former, you know, Soviet centers in the Soviet Central Asia, which are not that far from each other. Right. And so I think there's more of a kind of a cosmopolitan open kind of vibe in, in the North. And I think also the topography in the south is, the, you know, the mountainous areas and the rivers and so on and so forth mean that the, the, the travel is not quite so easy and there's a more of a conservative feel down there. Does that 
answer yep, the question. Yep, thank you. Yep. Okay, Bill Berger. Hey, Paul, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, incredibly interesting. Um, my daughter is studying feminism and movements and feminism um, in the US. And so I'm excited to share this with her. Um, but I'm curious, in your research, did you find um, that this, this uh, woman was being influenced by feminist movements in the US, like Me Too, et cetera? Was this something, was there anything that was moving her to be more, excuse me, more free to be able to express herself in this way? Yeah, I think that's part of it, certainly. Um, I didn't talk a lot about that because I was trying to just look at the data which I got from my interviews and looking at the video and, and so on and so forth. But the, the broader reading would say yes. And that's why I raised the question of, of how contextualized um, the video was and, and the song was. So there's a lot of, of, of flow of ideas from the West uh, into Central Asia. Um, and so that there are women who are, you know, who are tweeting, who are writing, who are going there and informing the debates about feminism in Central Asia. I mean, Zere speaks extremely good English, so she obviously can read and, and watch and interact with Western sources on feminism. Um, it's actually a project I want to do in more detail to look at where those influences are coming from. But I think the video shows that she... Um, she was trying to kind of take some ideas from the Western sphere mm. and bring them into her own context and say, hey, look at, you know, look at this diversity. The, the Muslim woman can run along in the desert next to the lady in the bikini. That's OK. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's very much a, a Western kind of way of looking at it. Now, of course, there may be people who would argue with me on this. And this is sort of a continuum. OK, you've got you've got Western feminism or Western. Yeah, call it Western feminism. You've got a kind of a Russian feminism that's going on. Mm. You know, you've got those kind of pussycat dolls and all those kind of people. And then you've got a much more local thing going on. So there's like a continuum. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's very interesting, this point, because it's not part of the video, but it's kind of the broader background. I mentioned um, an exhibition of women's rights um, in Bishkek about a year after the video was released. Now, in that, it's very interesting, in that museum, in that uh, exhibition, the, the naked woman who was walking around was actually Danish. So there are no naked Kyrgyz women walking around. A foreigner is brought in to walk around naked. Mm. But you have women washing out um, sheep's entrails in bowls of water to show that the life of Kyrgyz women and how they have to you know, wash all the entrails out because the husbands won't do it. So you have kind of multiple mm -hmm. uh, motifs of... of, of uh, feminist activism and one of the interesting things also was there was a punch bag holding from the ceiling which was in the shape of a woman's torso hmm. so you could see it you know, from you know so a woman's figure and the idea was that men hit women and that was so this thing was hanging up like a punch bag and when the conservative men came and complained that was the first thing that was removed was this punch bag so you see that the, the, the punch bag and you see that the naked woman walking around would very much represent a sort of a western idea hmm. but then the women washing out the entrails and kind of saying, well, this is what the life of Kyrgyz women is like. It's much more local thing. So I think you have multiple motifs going on. But the transnational nature of this is something that I want to look at more. Mm -hmm. Hey, Thank go you. with Chris Morton. Go ahead, Chris. Paul, can you hear me? Yep. yep. OK, good. Um, this is actually the country that my wife and I originally intended to be missionaries in back in the 90s. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, Kyrgyzstan has been on our heart for, for two decades now. And Bishkek actually used to be the sister city of Colorado Springs. Is that right? So, yeah, because both about the same altitude and all that good stuff. Um, but one of the things that we always found interesting is when we initially looked at going is to which ethnic group would you go to? And, yeah. and you highlighted the fact that perhaps more than I think, I believe it is more than in the rest of the Central Asian Republic, uh, you've got these this significant minority populations. And... I just was wondering with regards to, to the feminism issue here is uh, I, I understand that the Kyrgyz have been trying to reassert Kyrgyz mm. uh, identity. Well, part of that is, is birth rates. We know that women's uh, opportunity and liberation is, is definitely impacted by mm. fertility. Um, and Kyrgyzstan has the highest uh, fertility rate in Central Asia. Mm. And it, my understanding is it's highest among the Kyrgyz women. And I'm just wondering the effect that you've seen on trying to 
increase the Kyrgyz population to increase Kyrgyz control and how that might be impacting and limiting women and their opportunities. Um, you know, their primary role once again being seen as bearing the race. Yeah, I, I can't comment on that in terms of this 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 song, but I, I do know that is certainly an issue. Um, and the issue of sort of, you know, let's let's breed more Kyrgyz people. Um, I mean, there are there are moves to 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 reduce um, the percentage of Uzbek people. They like the Uzbek people to be sort of pushed out a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and the Russians, you know, why are these Russians here? Um, and I mean, I think now the percentage of Russians in Kyrgyzstan is about twenty percent. I think so. They have been 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 reduced. Um, but I think it really depends on who you are, because there are people who are quite open-minded who want cooperation over the Fergana Valley. And there are Kyrgyz people who talk to Uzbeks and want to cooperate. And there are other people who just say, you know, we want this kind of nationalist, one kind of uh, ethnic state. But I think those people are probably not really very realistic because it's just not going to happen. There's people who have been there because yeah. of, you know, and, and like all these countries which which fall apart, it's like Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, you know, that there are places which you just can't split because people live on either side of the street. So you have exactly that kind of thing going on, except that it's also by, by ethnic group. But there is a, an overall kind of, for many people, a sense of, yes, talking about the Manas, talking about the ethnic, you know, the epic history of the Kyrgyz people and their heritage in Siberia and all the rest of it. Um, just like there's a movement in, you know, in, in Mongolia with, with Genghis Khan, there is this kind of celebration right. of the past, which does play into it. And I think the whole thing, not just about childbearing, but the whole issue of ethnic pride, nationalism, does tend to just push women into the background. It does, yeah. Well, yeah. thanks, Paula. Uh, I, I had heard of this woman. I didn't know the lyrics, so thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, Marjorie. Yes, hi, Paul. Um, hi. Th hi, thanks so much for the, the lecture. And I love that um, you're looking at uh, popular media, um, just delving into that. Um, and that, that's, yeah, that's, that's, I really, that really, um, that makes me, that makes me happy. Um, one of the one of the questions I have, because um, I didn't um, know this, you know, this this woman before your presentation, and so in a sense, who was she? How how did her song even get played? Like, was she, did she have some type of following, or had she made uh, music before that was that people knew of her? Mm -hmm. So this goes back to like Bill's question of like, where are the influences? How was she even on anybody's radar? Um, you know, uh, to, to get to this place of having this song uh, be so influential. And then I'm also curious as to what was it that drew you to this video um, in this particular country? I don't know if this is a, a place that you've been looking at or what drew you to this to this particular project? OK, well, the first the first uh, question, this was her first song. Um, and since then, she has become a kind of a, a singer songwriter, and she has produced an album, I think, of about five or six um, songs now, which are all roughly to do with feminism and human rights and all that kind of stuff. Um, she has been an activist for some time. So she has the sort of, you know, the, the Twitter, Instagram, Facebook kind of presence, VK in the Russian world. Um, telegram and so so she is uh, she is a person very active on social media and as part of of the broader kind of ngo sphere of women's activists there are people who follow her and and know about her um she is also an english teacher actually her, her day job if you like used to be um teaching english in bishkek so i think there was a kind of a maybe not quite a critical mass but certainly people knew her and then the song was released a few weeks before the video so I don't know how the song was released, but the video was actually released on social media. So, so, so like, so like a YouTube type thing. Yes, yeah. So, so she didn't, she didn't go, you know, cut a CD or make a vinyl record or whatever, you know, right. whatever people do. I don't know. It was actually all released on social media. So it's basically you just play on YouTube, download, uh -huh. and it went absolutely viral within the space of hours. People were sharing it, you know, over various social media platforms. And I guess once something begins to go viral and people know each other, especially among the younger people, boom, you know, that's yeah, yeah, where the word yeah. viral comes from. Yeah. How, was, how was I drawn to this? As I say, I can't actually remember how I found the video because it seems long ago in the mist of time. But I um, 
two things are important. A few years ago, I was part of the International Gender Studies Group in Oxford. And a woman called Jakin came from Bishkek and she gave talks about uh, bride kidnapping and women's rights in, in Kyrgyzstan. And it just struck me that this was something which was um, interesting because I've long been interested in the post-Soviet world um, and I'm interested in this whole idea of, of transnational phenomena and, and, and human rights and how that might relate to, to, to mission, how it might relate to, to the sort of research that, that we do in OCMS. Um, and then, of course, I have this student, Kanat, who, who comes from mm. Kyrgyzstan. And just being with him, talking with him, and reading several of the novels of um, Genghis Edmatov, who is the guy that he is studying in his research, it just kind of brought alive this whole interest in that post-Soviet world that I've had for many years. You know, I mean, I grew up in, with the Cold War. So it was basically just a question of lighting the touchback, the blue paper, mm. and then touch paper and standing back, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Th great. Thank you. You're Paul. Welcome. Yes, Tom. No, not the other Paul. <laughs> the other Paul. Hey, hi, Paul. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, uh, very interesting. Um, you, you've touched on the issue of, of contextualization and, and so on. And I guess one of the things that struck me um, listening to the song and listening to you talking was um, just where the ideas of freedom are coming from, but also um, what not just she but others are expressing freedom looks like this yeah um, the song seems to um, uh, focus in exclusively on freedom is the right to um, dress in whichever way you choose um, and that's all acceptable um, but I wonder are you seeing in your research um, more nuanced understandings of freedom in the public space in Kyrgyzstan? Are they emerging? Um, and in particular, are you seeing any sign that um, local resources for understanding what freedom looks like, rather than just a traditional, you can't do this and you mm. can do that, but are there any local resources that are informing a more progressive um, understanding of freedom? Okay, well, the, the first point, um, I don't think the song is actually about just the freedom to dress as you want. Um, I mean, she had she made a four minute video, you know, and she, sure, made, a song, sure. it's limited. she made a song saying, yeah. don't, don't tell us what to do. But yeah, you know, as I said, if you look at some of the motifs in there, it's actually about diversity. And it's about not judging a book by its cover. Um, and of course, some of what she has done has also been adopted by the LGBT people, you know, so they've also yeah, taken yeah. this in that direction. Yeah. But I think what she's really talking about is um, the freedom to be yourself within a society which traditionally doesn't let you be yourself. When when she says, um, when she talks about freedom, she says, I'm a free person. The Russian word, she actually says, I have the freedom of the word, the freedom of speech. So I think it's about being able to speak in public and being respected for having a viewpoint which is different from the traditional one of the past. Now, in this question of women's rights, what she is complaining about is how women are denied this, denied that. Women are kidnapped, women are beaten. Mm. And so she's looking for equality rather than, you know, a, a feminist agenda which says that she should, be, she should be above a man. She said we want to be equal. So I think this is a response to traditional values, uh, uh, probably informed by some of the Soviet stuff that Tom mentioned about women's equality. Um, but wanting that, that everybody should be able to be treated equal regardless of, of who they are, what they believe. Now, in terms of you know, local understandings of what freedom might be, um, that didn't come out in this song. Um, but surveys of public opinion, especially among young people, I've read a very long document about public opinion in Kyrgyzstan, and it does seem to suggests that the country is still quite conformist. And so young people would hold to traditional values. They would listen to what their parents say. They would respect teachers. And so they wouldn't talk about the freedom in the way that perhaps we might talk about it in the West as saying it's all about me, which is actually not really fair to freedom in the West either, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. idea that freedom is purely individualistic. So mm -hmm. I think what she's trying to do is actually more nuanced than what the mm -hmm. video 
suggests. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, again, she shot herself in the foot by making this well, look. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the fact that um, the song initially was was had widespread exactly uh, acclaim, and then exactly. in a way by choosing those particular images to yeah. project what she means by yeah uh, freedom and respect, yeah. um, she naturally narrows the field right down. Absolutely. I mean, so um, you know, she could have made the video with some men. That would have been helpful. <laughs> they could have all had some decent clothes on. I mean, you could have had a girl wearing jeans and a girl with a hijab. To show the difference you know you don't have to do this i mean it's not exactly not suitable for work but it's a little bit provocative you know and you didn't have to do that so so yeah it could have been a lot more nuanced but i think she came out of this issue of of the murder of, of a buddha lie you know and the police were entitled basically to put this guy who murdered her you know this guy was raped her throw her into in the prison in the police station with her and he basically had the freedom to kill her and yeah. so she was this is a kind of a a bit of spleen coming out at, at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the reality yeah. is a lot of these people, especially the NGOs, are a lot more nuanced than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Gui Chun. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation and lecture. And yes, um, it is very interesting uh, lecture. Um, after hearing your presentation and also looking at the lyrics, from my viewpoint, I think it's not only a gender issue from the uh, perspective of feminism, but also it may be a problem between generations from the perspective of um, um, postmodernism. So um, if, you, if you look at the lyrics again, it says that don't preach to me, you know, don't say that I have to do this one mm. or that, or it says I have got my own freedom of speech. Mm. So I wonder how strong is the wave of postmodernism amongst young people in their thinking and behavior? And how does it create some kind of polarization between the young generation and older generations? I'm just wondering, are you correlating freedom of speech with postmodernism? Yeah. That's an interesting point for a start. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question of postmodernism, um, there's some mention of postmodernism in Kyrgyzstan, but uh, it's not particularly strong. I think people like Zeli are mostly going against tradition. And um, of course, they're not happy with some of the way that Islam is seen as controlling people. I don't think necessarily makes them postmodern. I think they want to, to uh, adopt a different narrative, not necessarily say that there is no narrative. Uh, because also in their law, their law says that women are equal to men in, in the legal mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. um, and when you read about the, the incidents of, of domestic violence, um, what they're saying is, why should my husband be able to hit me and I have no no comeback? So they want freedom in that sense. Um, it's very interesting. There's another video, which I'm going to write another paper on by a woman called um, Jumalieva. And Jumalieva made a famous a parody of um, Staying Alive. You remember the Bee Gees, Staying Alive. And she shoots her life in a yurta, carrying a broom, playing it like a guitar, singing, staying alive. And the reason she chose that song is because she said the big challenge for women in the countryside is to stay alive rather than be beaten by their husbands. So if that's postmodernism, then I'm a postmodernist, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't think that postmodernism is quite the issue just yet. I think it's individual rights, which could spill over into postmodernism. It could yeah. spill over into un unhealthy things. Yeah. But at the moment, the pressure is to conform. Right. Yeah. Uh, just, just an interesting thought on that, Paul. I mean, there is a sense of constructed person, and mm -hmm. and, the, and the construction that's waiting within the the set society. Yeah. And the wanting to fashion to oneself. Yeah. But, but um, yeah. Yeah, and and I feel you know it's interesting. I think it was you, Tom, talked about this whole issue of of the Russian, you know, the Soviet values at the beginning. Um, there are people who feel that the society was more egalitarian under the Soviets and under their yeah. own their own rules. Um, I mean, everybody was in danger in the Soviet period. Now only women are in danger. That, that's what they would say. Um, and so, and they would also say with the creeping authoritarianism, which is happening in Central Asia um, and in Kyrgyzstan, especially, you know, it, it, well, not especially in highlighted recently, they would feel that they're losing ground. Mm. So, so when, you know, Kirk Choro come and say, well, actually we're partly supported by the government or at least the government closes one eye when we ride our horses and cause trouble they feel that the rights they have as women are being eroded. Traditional rights. 
lives. Uh, well, the, the, no, the rights, the rights which they had under the Soviet system or which they associate with the equality, which is actually in their law, are being eroded now by, by some of the people becoming more traditional. Dan, go ahead. Yes, mine, mine's a fairly uh, similar question. What, what comes over from the statements the song is making is, is not merely generational, unless you see it in terms of generational in the West, but it's very existentialist. Yeah, yeah. John Paul, Jean Paul Sartre, um, Monty Python, uh, <laughs> whatever is trying to bring down the icons of, of, of the day in a particular culture. Sure. Um, um, I'm not saying this is because they have read John Paul Sartre, but much more likely this is mediated into their, their subconscious by watching Hollywood movies or um, 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 something which, which gives a, a, a very different attitude to life for, um, as compared with, with being a, um, a Muslim herder. Um, so I would have thought that um, the old men and women um, uh, of the people would say, uh, would uh, just at the images and the words, they would immediately react, um, at least internally, to say, this is just what we don't want. It looks Western. It sounds Christian. Um, um, what is happening to our society? Yeah, that's definitely the case for, for some of the people. Um, of course, some of the older people would actually have a hankering for the old days of the Soviet system, when at least everybody was clear and you knew where you stood and there wasn't a threat from Islam, because there are many people who are traditionally minded who actually don't want, uh, they don't want girls in short skirts, but neither do they want, um, you know, guys in long beards. I mean, they don't want girls in burkas either. So, you know, th there is this whole thing about, well, people want different things. And sometimes the generations, the generation above is actually open to some of the values of the Soviet period rather than some of the more, possibly more extreme stuff coming out of Islamic people. But you're absolutely right, yeah. Okay, let's go with Tara. Go ahead, Tara. Thank you so much, Paul. Such an Hi. interesting work. You know, that's um, everything fascinating to me. And I find... Um, my curiosity, I, I get very uncomfortable when um, I see, and it would definitely be perceived as extreme feminism in that particular context, local context. And I'm wondering, um, you know, like, as you said, stated, this ended up being much more controversial and much more widely spread and viral than this woman's area ever expected it to be. And, um, I like that you showed some of the feedback both for men and women because mm -hmm. I feel like what other local women have to say is perhaps some of the most valid mm -hmm. information in the argument. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have seen, um, if she's done any other kinds of things that have been like at the same level of controversy, if she's learned anything about this experience to be able to sharpen her voice. I like I watched that video and I think of a mm -hmm. thousand ways to coach this woman <laughs> yeah. to make a bigger yeah. impact. Um, cause she ostracized so many people with some of those choices and she yeah. could have included a lot more and strengthened her voice with others. And so I'm wondering if, how the follow-up has been with her, if she's, if she's made some strides in gaining information. Well, like I said, this is, this was her first song and she's now made four subsequent ones. Um, and one of them Any actually, with she... videos? pardon? Any songs with videos? Oh yes. Oh yeah. All as far as I okay. know. The, the second one that she made, I forget the name of it now. Um, it shows that she plays a person being arrested by the Kyrgyz police. And so she's kind of dragged into this room wearing this white smock and these two guys kind of manhandling her. And I haven't had time to go into it yet. Um, when this whole thing broke and people were threatened to cut her head off, she was really spooked. And at one point she decided to leave Kyrgyzstan and go into exile. You know, and there are a number of commentators on women's issues who now live in Ukraine or Russia or elsewhere because I just think it's too dangerous. Um, but I think, you know, you, you know, we talk about her as maybe being a bit extreme. Yeah, and I think what, what she did was coming out of the murder of Budalai and other things, right. she swung too far. She went, you know, if I, if I, 
if I try and go for 10 yards, I might get five. And I think that's what she was trying to do. And I think, you know, part of what I want to do in my next kind of research is look at what happened later with the videos and and see, um, yeah, did, did she learn anything? Did she learn from her, not exactly a mistake, but did she learn from her experience? You know, and, and the commentary has kind of um, died down. But like I said, you know, now she's been on, on talk shows in, in Georgia where Georgian feminists are talking to her about, you know, what does it mean to be a woman and so on and so forth. And so I think she has kind of, garnered a degree of respectability because I think some of the feminist activists in Central Asia and, and the former Soviet Union said you know this is really good um, and I think probably behind the scenes they probably said can you tone it down a bit and can you now um, engage in a kind of more constructive dialogue mm -hmm. and if you see her interviewed I mean she puts words together very very well she's a very intelligent woman you know she's not some kind of rabble rouse i mean it's interesting the video that i i showed you my source at the top left hand corner was her being interviewed mm -hmm. um by this woman on the television in bishkek and the title of the interview she calls her describes herself as a buntar and which is a baker a troublemaker and she says so it, it seems the title of the the, the the interview is it seems i'm a troublemaker it seems i'm a rebel so it's like oh this happened to me and i think she probably has learned now with so much stuff that's been on blogs and instagram and all the rest of it that she has learned to engage with these issues more new in a more nuanced and more intelligent kind of way i, I think but if you want to I coach thought, her i mean by all means go over there <laughs> i thought it visually interesting as well as opposed to her uh tire in the video and all of those other interviews and all the other images that you captured to mm. show us she's wearing big bulky clothing so it doesn't yeah. seem that she sets out to be a provocative woman. No, she was, doesn't. She was doesn't. trying to make a loud statement in that. Yeah. In that and I video. think when she made the video, I mean, the video was thrown together very, very quickly. You know, she just sat with some friends and they made up what to do. And they just drove over there and started jumping into the, oh, into the lake. And, you know, she said, oh, I found this bra and I, I decided to dye it purple. And I think it was all a little bit ad hoc. Mm -hmm. um, and... Well, I guess she can't say that was a mistake because then she'd lose, not only lose face, but she'd lose ground for the feminists. So, yeah, I think she's probably been chastened by the experience, you know. Thank okay, you. Well, thank, thank you, Paul. I think we'll tie a bow on it and uh, uh, very good and a great series on Central Asia. And I hope this is not the end of that. I think there's a lot more here that can be looked at and just in terms of the whole region. But yeah. thank you very much. And um, thank you. Thank all of you for joining. And with that, I will bid adieu.